Am I coming through? Yes. Yes, you are. We're good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the uh, February 16th meeting of the Fairfax County uh, Economic Advisory Commission. Uh, a very interesting meeting for everyone today. Uh, obviously, it's a very interesting times there at the county. Uh, before we get started, there are uh, some uh, procedural matters which we've done in the past uh, that I have to do to uh, conduct this virtual meeting. So uh, to conduct this meeting wholly electronically, the Economic Advisory Commission needs to make certain findings for the record to evidence our compliance with all applicable laws. As a preliminary matter, FOIA requires us to ascertain the general location of each member participating remotely. I would ask that each EAC member note your general location in the chat box or send that information to Vance Zabella at vance.zabella, Z-A-V-E-L-A, at fairfaxcounty.gov. You can include your magisterial district or your general region, such as Oakton, Reston, Lorton, et cetera. In addition, if you cannot adequately hear another member, please also so note that matter in the chat box so that the issue can be addressed. So I need to make two motions and uh, therefore I need to pass the gavel to the EAC's vice chair, uh, uh, Supervisor Stork and uh, Supervisor Stork, are you with us? I I am here. Uh, there, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Morning. I move that the Economic Advisory Commission certify that the oh, state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this commission and the public to physically attend this meeting in person. And usual procedures cannot be implemented safely or practically. As a result, I further move that the Economic Advisory Commission conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated video and audio conferencing line and that the public may access this meeting by calling 602-333-0032 and entering access code 167352. So moved. And um, the I, I sure will second it. Um, any discussion? Not all those in favor signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We have one opposed. Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next uh, motion. Finally, I move uh, that the Economic Advisory Commission certify that the matters on its agenda today relate to the COVID-19 emergency itself, are necessary for continuity in Fairfax County government, and or are statutorily required or necessary to continue operations and the discharge of the Commission's lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities, so moved. The vice chair will second it as well again. Um, any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand or, or saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Chairman Faust. Thank you, uh, uh, Supervisor Stork. Uh, I will uh, now take back the gavel and call upon uh, Chase Suddeth, uh, who will present a how to participate presentation uh, in terms of your uh, participation in today's meeting. Chase? Good morning, everybody. Um, and just confirm that you could see my slides. Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, I just wanted to run through a little bit of housekeeping very briefly uh, before we get started. Um, if you're participating on a mobile phone, the mute button will be in the bottom left. The same thing if you're presenting or if you're... Please make sure that your microphone is muted 
throughout uh, the meeting unless you're speaking. Um, and we'll, we will do a question and answer period later on. Um, if you need to raise your hand, the raise your hand feature can be found in the participants section. That's uh, between the share screen button and the invite button on your view. Um, you can cl click that and it'll show you how to raise your hand. Third, please rename yourself uh, because as uh, Supervisor Faust stated, um, as to get consistent with the legal guidelines for this meeting, um, you need to have your full name accurately listed. So in order to do that, just right click your name in the middle of the video and change it, or you can change it from the participants list. Um, but again, please make sure that that is accurately listed and we have to do that for uh, the rules of this meeting. The third or the final thing is that this is a public meeting. It is being recorded. Uh, so you are consenting to the recording and this will be posted later on the county's website so that people can watch and tune in to see the business of the meeting. So again, we'll be, we'll be checking the, the chat box as well. And we'll also be making sure that people are muted. So if you get muted, um, that is why. So now you know about the rules, you know about the lifelines and I will turn it back over to Chairman Faust. Thank you very much, Chase. Appreciate your, your efforts. Um, before we uh, get started, we had minutes that were distributed. Uh, everyone should have gotten a copy. Unless uh, there are any changes or revisions that uh, you want to bring to our attention, we'll let those meetings stand as a record of our, or those minutes stand as a record of our last meeting. Okay. So, in terms of opening remarks, I would like to concentrate on uh, the uh, a recent development involving the framework, which, uh, as we discussed at our last meeting, the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority and the county's uh, economic initiatives uh, uh, department, Department of Economic Initiatives, uh, work with a consulting firm to evaluate the impacts of the pandemic and to prepare uh, an economic plan to help guide and uh, expedite our recovery efforts. Uh, supervisors have received a final draft of that uh, economic recovery framework uh, and will uh, uh, have a detailed discussion of it at our next uh, economic initiatives committee, which will be held on March 16th. That's the economic initiatives committee, uh, board only members, but uh, you are strongly encouraged to tune in because it's gonna set the direction uh, for our efforts at economic recovery, I believe, for uh, some time to come. So the framework outlines recommendations for fostering uh, a resilient economic uh, recovery. Framework demonstrates that many businesses actually have been able to do and adapt reasonably well uh, to all that's happening around us with COVID. However, uh, it's also very clear that uh, the pandemic did not impact all communities equally and that the uh, greatest impact uh, of the, uh, the pandemic has been on the minority and low income communities in the county. So uh, the, similarly, the pandemic uh, has had a disproportionate impact across certain industries, uh, certainly hospitality, food service, small retailers and the arts and entertainment uh, industries were really heavily impacted. And then another interesting, I believe, uh, finding the report is that uh, the framework notes that 90% of all job losses in the county took place in industries with average wage, wages less than 80% of AMI. So you can see the job losses just disproportionately impacted uh, low income uh, workers uh, and we need to focus on that fact. So assistance in many forms, including but not limited to financial grants is needed to help operators in these impacted business sectors to adapt to changing conditions and to thrive in the long term. So uh, I'm very uh, excited about the fact that on uh, February 9th at, our, at the board meeting, the board directed staff to work with the Economic Development Authority to develop recommendations for targeted relief including possibly recovery grants and programs to support Fairfax County businesses and nonprofits identified in the framework as having been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. The board asked staff to consider recommendations for funding these 
proposals in the range of 10 to $15 million from funds included in the economic opportunity reserve. So the board also directed that staff's recommendations should be brought to the board of supervisors economic initiatives committee again as March 16th meeting for consideration. So we'll get the, the full detailed uh, discussion of the report and recommendations from staff at that meeting. Uh, there are other things going on uh, in the county that uh, obviously uh, focus on economic recovery, but uh, we will, and we will get an update on some of those at the end of this meeting, time permitting. But in the interim, we have some very interesting uh, presentations and we're not going to uh, limit them any more than uh, necessary. So I don't know that we'll get to further updates. Uh, so let me, uh, before we move on, it's, it's always uh, good to get the perspective of the chairman who's getting it from all directions and involved in many different things uh, as we work our way through this uh, uh, you know, unprecedented uh, impact of a, a pandemic. So uh, Chairman McKay, uh, do you have uh, any update for us on uh, what, what you might wanna share? Uh, sure. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Faust, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see uh, so many folks participating in this in this vital committee. And uh, really, I just want to uh, share my excitement uh, over where we are as, as a county. Uh, as all of you know, we're, we're struggling to get through this pandemic, but uh, we're doing it better than about anywhere else in the country, and we will recover uh, better than anywhere else in the country. And I know we're all confident of that. Uh, really, I wanted to also share my excitement for today's agenda. Um, this hits close and, and personal uh, for me. The Richmond Highway Corridor is, is where I was born and raised and uh, presents us a tremendous opportunity uh, in Fairfax County. And as I have said uh, repeatedly, the county needs all of its economic engines working. Uh, Tyson's is the biggest, uh, most critical uh, epicenter in the county, but we need to make sure that all of our smaller engines across the county uh, are also fired up and ready to help us recover from this pandemic. And we face uh, really a once in a lifetime opportunity on the highway. Uh, not only uh, do we all say that the pandemic has given us a chance to build back better, uh, more equitably, uh, more completely uh, for our community, there's very few places in the county that present a better opportunity to succeed doing that than the Route 1 corridor. Um, it has tremendous opportunity. Uh, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity where we are investing over $1 billion in infrastructure on the highway and both improving pedestrian safety and environmental features, uh, putting in bus rapid transit, uh, ultimately a planning for a Metro extension uh, we're putting in the infrastructure. There's the community excitement around rebuilding the Route 1 corridor more equitably better. And frankly, there's a lot of communities of interest and historic resources, uh, affordable housing uh, that we must protect as we do that uh, and advance that. And so uh, this is a great opportunity in another part of the county uh, to focus on equitable uh, redevelopment in an area that, that really needs it. Um, I want to thank uh, the EDA, uh, Supervisor Stork, Supervisor Lusk as well. Uh, this effort started under a past director uh, at the EDA, um, and while I was still lead district supervisor, and we've been working on this for a long time, uh, are excited to share some of our, our results, uh, some of our opportunities in the highway, but this has been an effort that the EDA has partnered with Fairfax County on uh, for a number of years. Uh, and we're very excited about it. So hopefully uh, after the presentation, you'll see why there's great opportunity uh, in the highway and how we can translate the things we're saying in this pandemic into action, uh, into a part of the county that really needs uh, a shot in the arm, uh, revitalization, uh, and really can be an economic uh, engine for Fairfax County. The last thing I will say, and uh, to take away anything about Route 1, I always tell people take away this. The largest employer in Fairfax County is on the Route 1 corridor, and that is Fort Belvoir. And if anything, we have great opportunities to continue to partner with the federal government, with our contracting industry, uh, to continue to grow our economy in Fairfax County. And the largest employer in the county is on the Route 1 corridor. And a lot of folks don't realize that. 
And there are tremendous opportunities uh, around Fort Belvoir as, as a partner uh, as we advance forward. And so thank you for letting me share a few comments with you. As always, know that we are spending every minute of every day uh, fighting this pandemic, fighting to get vaccines in the arms of people so that we can uh, really get past uh, this trouble spot that we're in right now. And if my office can ever uh, do anything to help any of you, please uh, reach out. And with that, let um, me turn it back to our, our great chair of this committee, uh, Supervisor Faust. Thank you very much, Chairman McKay. Uh, that, that was a, a great uh, way to introduce our next, uh, or our first substantive topic on the agenda this morning. Uh, I'll give you a little idea of where we're headed. The county's consultants from the firm of uh, Partners for Economic Solutions are going to present their findings of a year long study undertaken to evaluate Richmond Highway's commercial real estate market and the impact of a bus rapid transit system on future demand and development. Uh, the presentation will include findings and recommended focus areas. In a moment, I will introduce the founding principles of that firm and I'll ask them to make the presentation, but and following their presentation, we'll hear from Victor Hoskins, president of the county's Economic Development Authority on uh, what's next. Uh, we will then open the discussion and hopefully uh, there'll be an opportunity for uh, commission members to share their thoughts and insights on uh, types of uh, tools and data that uh, would be helpful to implement uh, what is gonna be proposed to you today. Uh, but before we do anything else, uh, Chairman McKay, highlighted uh, two supervisors who are uh, just working uh, just uh, constantly and, and uh, very uh, focused on uh, this area of the county and uh, its revitalization, making it a, a, you know, a much, much more vibrant uh, uh, player in terms of the local economy. And that's Supervisor Dan Stork and uh, Supervisor Rodney Lusk. And, uh, since this is their area and their study, I, uh, I'm going to ask uh, first Dan and then Rodney if they uh, would like to make a few comments to the commission about what's uh, happening in their world down there. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you very much. And, and I also want to thank uh, Chairman McKay for his really summary of where we've been, the journey that we've been on. And, and he knows that very, very well, having spent decades working and making a difference in this quarter. Uh, he and I partnered when he was supervisor of the district and now as chairman to really work along the corridor and obviously welcomed um, Supervisor Lust as part of that team. And, and I think we've been doing a number of things just to do a, a little history here. Um, we had the embark uh, comprehensive plan changes that we made in 2018. That took a couple years. And prior to that, we had a study, a DPRT study that really identified that we need uh, if you will, mass transit down the corridor, in this case, BRT and Albany Metro. Uh, the comprehensive plan changes resulted in, in uh, at that time, Supervisor uh, McKay and I putting together a strategic economic development team. And we involved EDA and SFDC and the chambers and really the, the county uh, departments. And we built a team to focus on economic development in the Richmond Highway Corridor. And we've made a number of steps, a number of uh, efforts to do just that and to make progress on that. This study, this market analysis study, in many ways is one of the steps on that process. Victor Hoskins, when he came on board and, and kind of had a tour of the area, realized that we really need something to help to activate that effort as well. So this study is really the next follow on to do that. And we recognize we have some key elements here. Number one is Fort Belvoir and government employment is a huge part of what we do but also hospitality, tourism, and retail is a huge part of the Richmond Highway Corridor. And again, we have healthcare. So we have a lot of different mixes, but they've, they've uh, not been grown as, as quickly as we'd like and not been as successful as we'd like. And so this study will help us point and focus our efforts far more. So looking forward to the presentation as well as the follow-on, which is really the key to, to activating and, and making a difference in, in the quarter. So thank you, Chairman Faust. Thank you uh, very much, Supervisor Stork. Uh, now uh, I will turn to Supervisor Lusk and uh, ask you to do the same, Rodney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanna first thank Victor Hoskins for sponsoring this uh, market study. It was an important and necessary first step for us to undertake as we reimagine and set into motion the future changes for this area. 
I additionally want to commend Partners for Economic Solutions for the extensive analysis, thought, and specific recommendations that are contained in this final report, which provides us a framework for understanding where the historic Richmond Highway corridor is today regarding its existing conditions and a possible path forward in the specific market areas of retail, hotel, and office. And I'll say I'm no stranger to the inherent issues uh, plaguing the corridor. Uh, most of my life has revolved around this corridor. Like the chairman, I was born at Dewitt Army Hospital at Fort Belvoir. I grew up in the city of Alexandria as a teenager. I worked in a number of uh, positions along the Route 1 corridor. I also worked in human services and I served as a lead district planning commissioner where I helped to shepherd a number of projects, including the Beacon at Groton. And this is important because that was the first TOD rezoning approval on the corridor where we basically moved the buildings up and pushed the parking uh, back uh, from the site. And I also helped with the repositioning of Federal Realty's Hyper Valley and now Vernon shopping centers, um, just to name a few. I concur with the report's findings and understand the constraints with office, including the lack of class A space on the corridor, which currently represents about 8% of our total inventory. And the fact that most of our office project was built from the 1960s to the 1980s. We have a lot of obsolete buildings that are principally class C and that were not at the top of the list for the government contractors technology or business services firms that I supported uh, in their quest to find new or expansion office locations while working at the Fairfax County Economic Development Board. I would not be honest if I did not express that it was disappointing that these firms were not interested in locating or expanding their businesses on the corridor, which explains the importance of knowing your strengths and determining a strategy to position the area for future success. This study helps us do that. There are so many changes that I have seen occur on this corridor and I am bullish on its future. The corridor is in the midst of change. And Supervisor Stork mentioned our bus rapid transit project, our Embark Richmond Highway plan. We talked about the widening of Richmond Highway. All of these things are underway for the seven and a half mile stretch of uh, Richmond Highway. This study and its findings are the first step in plotting our course which I look forward to working with the community and Supervisor Stork and others to develop an implementation plan. I will not go through all the recommendations, but I'm particularly supportive of three. I support the development of changing and creating a sense of place and starting with our public uh, buildings. I support providing technical assistance to small minority and veteran owned businesses. And I'll say uh, to the point that Chairman Faust made we're gonna to have to put some financial skin in the game and the work that he has led um, and with the chairman to consider a 10 to $15 million deployment of the Economic Opportunity Reserve Fund is gonna be instrumental. And this program will have a significant impact in helping both firms now and into the future. And then third, I also support working with the community to identify activating open spaces and working to give each of our CBCs a unique signature. And this is so important because we don't want the CBCs competing with themselves. And we want to create a unique identity for each one. So in conclusion, I appreciate the work that has been done to create the study and commit to helping advance the success of these CBCs by helping the residents in the Hyble Valley communities who have the lowest median income $51,270 of any CBC on the, on the quarter in the following three ways. One, development of a training and employment center at the old Mount Vernon Tennis and Athletic Center that contains, that contains a trades and maker space. Two, identification of specific entry level technology, trades and other jobs that pay competitive wages and the associated certifications or other trainings that would be needed to qualify for these jobs. This increased income will allow these residents to become self-sufficient, permitting them, permitting them to move into the middle class and providing them with more disposable income that can be used to support local businesses in the area. And third, working with local partners to identify the emerging technology sectors that could obtain a foothold on the quarter 
going back to the point that the chairman made, Fort Belvoir is a significant asset to the south and to the north, Amazon is also a significant asset. We'll look at technologies which could include drones, sensor technologies, building trade technologies, and others. I'm so excited and I really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak here and look forward to the presentation. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Supervisor Lusk. I think it's pretty obvious that uh, that corridor is in very good hands with the leadership of uh, Chairman McKay and the amazing uh, focus of Supervisors Stork and Lusk. So uh, thank you uh, for your efforts. Now it's my pleasure uh, uh, to introduce the founding principles of the Partnership for Economic Solutions who prepared this study. Uh, first, uh, Nita Morrison is, founded Partners for Economic Solutions after more than 30 years of economic and development consulting. During her 44 year career, Anita has specialized in public private partnerships, real estate advisory services, redevelopment strategies, and economic impact analysis. Also I'd like to introduce Abigail Ferretti, another principal and founding principal of Partners for Economic Solutions. Abigail uh, focuses on managing a firm's urban practice with an emphasis on revitalizing older communities. With 23 years of experience managing small and large redevelopment projects, Abigail is fully vested in a variety of approaches and strategies. Without further ado, uh, Ms. Morrison and Ms. Fretti, would you take the, uh, make your presentation? Great, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen this morning and make sure that everyone can see the presentation. And I want to just want to thank uh, chairman and supervisors for their awesome introduction. We had a high level of engagement from Supervisor Lusk and Supervisor Stork throughout the entire process. And I want to say that not only their words, but they made certain we were able to engage key stakeholders. They gave us all of the background information and they really helped us uh, move forward in terms of the current and changing market conditions. As, as we said, we came in prior to the pandemic and then worked through the pandemic on this process. Obviously, uh, this process is really a market assessment and study to look at the ways that we can leverage the new private transit-oriented uh, development investment of the BRT, the bus rapid transit, along the Richmond Highway Corridor. Our market assessment considers the impact of that heavy investment and the success that we've seen in other communities across the nation and was part of the reason why we were attracted to pursue the work to begin with. So our process began with um, starting with setting the stage for what the future strategy work that the county and many of the private and nonprofit partners that are joining us on this meeting today will be implementing. Our work began with an assessment of the existing conditions. So that's your general General demographics, but it's also understanding the background of where we were. This is a regional population growth pressures that are happening every day and the opening of the Amazon's HQ2 headquarters in Arlington, that bus rapid transit improvements and the corridors changing nature and really looking at retail, hospitality in the office conditions. We did not look at uh, residential, but we did do projections, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And then we moved into the step of actually, after we assessed those conditions, looking at the market for those uses and near-term potential and long-term potential. And then the county was very wise. And when they hired us, they asked us to look at some really specific opportunities and specific responses to market themes that come up again and again along the Richmond Highway corridor. And I think our experience, which we were just talked about in our bios and introduction for PES, really helped us bridge a gap and bring in lessons learned, which is the next step. We really decided to look at near-term priorities. What would we say will help the market? What have we seen in similar corridors throughout the nation and in counterpart jurisdictions and organizations? How have they leveraged the private market to get the best outcome? How have they leveraged those public resources? And it's important to note that our work here is not a revitalization strategy, but just an assessment of the conditions it's intended to inform the county on that strategy as it moves forward, but it sets the stage based on the market. As economists, we like to give you that, what's the best place to spend your efforts and your priorities at first. So our market assessment looks at those seven CBCs, which are the community, 
business centers. Someone asked in the chat earlier. And again, we started with residential projections. So we considered all seven CBCs, but it's important to note there's no market distinction between North Gateway and Huntington. And so those merged together. There is a distinction in those two CBCs, but there's not a meaningful distinction in the substantial enough to consider them differentially. So as we go through the presentation, you'll see that those two CBCs are merged together in our findings and results. So although our analysis did not look at the residential, we did project future household growth. And this is important to understand because we know that new households is expected to overwhelmingly be concentrated in multifamily apartments, condominiums, and potential townhouse development. We looked at the pipeline, which is roughly 3,700 units. And we believe that the households in the corridor will increase 50% with the addition of roughly 17,600 new households by 2035. The BRT improvements in the corridor will help it compete for development by enhancing transit access and hoping to, helping to focus that demand into the CBCs. We looked at the retail, which is about 3.9 million square feet. And I have to tell you that your retail is pretty healthy and doing relatively stable, especially compared to other jurisdictions that we're working on in this exact same time frame throughout the country who did not have the wherewithal that Fairfax County did or the foresight to really invest during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And I'll talk about that more and how that success of the RISE program really helped prevent some of the failures that we see in other commercial corridors. Obviously, for the hotel industry, there we looked at the whole corridor, about 1,124 rooms that were competitive and three independent hotels with an additional 204 rooms. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, all the hotels along the Richmond Highway corridor were performing very well by industry standards. Unfortunately, the hospitality industry has taken a big hit. And so we had to really consider how long that recovery would take and where we would see the potential in the near term and the long term along the corridor. Then we looked at the office market. And I think that Supervisor Lust did a great job of kind of talking about where we are and where we're positioned, but it's about 1.2 million square feet along the corridor. And again, while it's not expected to be a class A dominant location, it does have some success. Um, when we look at office market, we consider it in the competitive environment. And so it's important to consider what other things we see happening. I apologize, I'm not able to read the chat. So if there's anything that um, is happening in the chat, I'll have to get to those questions afterwards. It's not showing up on my screen. So let's just take a deep dive into the retail conclusion. So for the retail conclusions, we project that there'll be between 450 roughly and 500,000 square feet of space. We will see contraction in the retail environment. So those obsolescent spaces, the former small houses that were converted to retail will eventually be demolished or replaced. But what we do anticipate is that the replacement retail will come in at higher costs that are normally associated with mixed use development, and that means higher rents. So achieving those rents will depend on creating a really great pedestrian environment, good connections to adjoining neighborhoods, and adequate parking to attract customers to the features. Well, care will need to be taken in terms of design and modern configuration and all this information is in the report. As you can see, the majority of the new retail really will occur in Hybla Valley, Gum Springs, and Beacon Groveton, where you have quality shopping centers with great ownership and a critical mass that'll help to draw more competition and more customer base. It's important to note that these estimates um, are provided in more detail in the report, but that they are looking in the next 10 years. For the hotel analysis, we spent a considerable amount of time understanding the, the hospitality industry's impact from COVID. Prior to the pandemic, as I mentioned, those hotels along the corridor were doing well, but we really see the hospitality industry as two clusters, the Northern cluster and the Southern cluster along the Richmond Highway corridor. So looking for a minute at the Northern cluster, you can see the competition in the Eisenhower Valley, Alexandria and National Landing. Folks go to those locations when they consider here. And we know that the tourism industry is greatly impacted by the pandemic and the like. And so when we looked at the competition, we see that there are more than 4,000 rooms near the area. This is really important that these competitive clusters are impacting Richmond Highway, in particular, the northern end of the Richmond Highway Hotel corridor. Occupancy rates, however, are still strong enough that we believe the northern 
section could support a hotel at the Huntington Metro station in the near term after recovery. And we anticipate recovery will be four to five years. So after four to five years, there could be the addition of a new hotel to that supply. And we would recommend that it be located at the Huntington Metro station to kind of make the most of that investment there. And then finally, the, the second half, the sort of Southern portion of hotels, there we've seen a real impact because of the base. Fort Belvoir is a great employer and an awesome asset to your community, but it is also a source of competition. They have lodging on the base. They have a lot of space there. They have availability for office space as well. And so unfortunately that has sort of created um, a, a struggle for additional supplemental hotels. And so I'd say long-term, uh, you could support another hotel and maybe even a boutique hotel offering if the tourism starts to be boosted again. And I wanna say, I know Barry uh, Biggers is on this call. I think the plans that are in place for the tourism assets in the Southern section of Richmond Highway, which will be cross-marketing and working together really should over the next five years, shift the tourism base and help us get to kind of that success along the corridor. For the office market conditions and the office conclusions, it's important to notice that we look at this in terms of the regional office market first. We take a step back and we understand what's happening there. And then we look around the marketplace to understand. So future demand is really constrained by the large amount of existing vacant space, not only in the Richmond Highway corridor, but in the competitive locations. And so it's important to note that developers will likely forego office development in favor of more profitable residential development in the next five to 10 years. But we do see some growth and that growth potential is in North Gateway Huntington. So 150 to 250,000 square feet. The Penda area, which is 25,000 to 75,000 square feet. And then jumping down the Richmond Highway corridor to South County Center and Woodlawn, which will have smaller um, but additional office space potential. The effects of the pandemic on the regional economy are continuing to impact local employment rates, business growth, and ultimately the demand for office space. The industry was shifting prior to the pandemic. And so we think that it's important to note that these, these shifts and changes and how we use office space is going to continue into the future. I would say that when I think of Richmond Highway, I think of these two images here in terms of office space potential. Right now, neighborhood office space continues to bring in folks that need to be near their customers. So these are insurance agents or someone uh, like a tax adjuster or tax preparation services, neighborhood service office. This is your physical therapist. These are your small medical office buildings. And there is a substantial amount of that space along the corridor, but it's successful and it's important to keep communities and residents um, meeting their needs. And so the Richmond Highway Quarters long-term office potential will focus on those smaller tenants included in occupying neighborhood servicing businesses. But there are additional opportunities and I shouldn't understate to make innovation maker space, places to test products, and they can be in a former shopping center building, they can be in the former um, Mount Vernon High School, but really older shopping centers provide opportunities for low cost short term leases to test some products and do some of that space. And that would be a welcome addition to the corridor. I think it's important to note that additional opportunities may exist to attract smaller companies that support new Amazon HQ2 or companies that are leaving Arlington's national landing in search of lower rents. So there is potential and we would certainly be remiss if we didn't mention that in office world, single tenant buildings are hard to predict because there's not many of them and they come in. Certainly Amazon's HQ2 and Nestle's coming into the nearby communities. We understand that the potential may exist along the border and that is not reflected in these overall demand numbers. Now to move to those corridor themes, as I mentioned, Fairfax County and the, as the client asked us to really consider these themes. And these are three of the main themes that we saw in general. And we wanted to look at these themes as they highlight existing problems and the future for the market trends. We wanna really be aware of them and try to respond to them so that we can continue to shift the market trajectory. So the primary constraint along the corridor is has been the built up nature, which was driven by the automobile. And the economics of redevelopment really require 
property prices that allow new development to generate an adequate return. So redevelopment can be significantly delayed when the returns don't justify the costs and the risk of new development. This is important in an auto area oriented suburban location. As you shift to urbanity in these CBCs, you're gonna need the densification, which will create that more walkable environment, but it'll also make the math and the return on investment adequate to get the investment that you seek. The second theme or concern for us is really this loss of legacy businesses. When we came into Richmond Highway and started looking at the business mix that you have along there, we were very impressed with the legacy and international businesses. We think that uh, those folks, as we know throughout the nation, struggle with high rents, credit worthiness, and changing market dynamics. New construction will typically require those higher rents that we talked about, and that limits the number of these types of retailers and service providers. So when you're a developer and you're creating a new mixed use project like we're talking about and that potential and that pressure, lenders and investors are gonna require you to get credit worthy tenants, including chain retailers who can sign longer leases. And that creates this problem because there's a you know a difference between what those folks can pay and what these ethnic so what businesses, do? legacy businesses are there. Yeah. So that urbanization is something where we really looked at technical and financial support and preservation of small affordable spaces that the county would need to step in and do. And I'm gonna go through some examples and talk about other places where they did this. And then finally, we wanna be really clear that we don't lose the distinction of Richmond Highway. It, we don't want it to become Route one anywhere USA. And I mean this because I travel anywhere and I see lots of route ones. We don't want to lose the distinct character. The Embark plan set out great character for each of these CBCs. And I think the long time small businesses and ethnic markets that are served are critical element of the Richmond Highway corridor and the retail offerings need to provide that unique shopping opportunities, but that authenticity can be reinforced with branding and um, placemaking and programming. So let's talk about that more. There is a framework that is being set out which um, will guide this transition along the Richmond Highway corridor and it's five categories. The physical, which is targeting that creation of place that we talked about and the supervisors talked about improving that public realm with buildings. And it'll also include property assemblage, which is encouraged by the county's economic incentive program. It's a wonderful step to get us moving in that direction infrastructure. That's the upgrades to your sidewalks, your bike trails, your streetscape, all that right-of-way improvement. And obviously, as uh, VDOT comes in and starts to acquire properties, that will be impacted. Technical assistance, that's working with the Office of Economic Initiatives, the Community Business Partnership, and Small Business Development Centers. This work spans offering basic business assistance, reducing red tape, and really accessing financing. And then there's community programming. This is perhaps maybe one of the ones that often um, folks think, oh, we're already doing that, but you can always do more would be my message from a market perspective. You engage the broader residential and business community. You search for open space as the supervisor talked about and you activate that with temporary urbanism. And we're gonna talk about some ways that that can be done. And then finally, investor and lender relations. We are really fortunate in Fairfax County that you have experienced staff with the ability to market to investors, property owners, real estate investment trusts, and highlight the different programs able to remove those financial gaps, such as the federal opportunity zones and Fairfax, um, EIP program, which I already mentioned. And so those lessons learned from other uh, entities are found in the report, but basically we're talking about major public investment essential to changing the physical environment and the supporting those private redevelopment efforts, enhancing the pedestrian experiment experience and placemaking will be key to shifting from suburbia to urbanity in this strip commercial center to a more urban environment corridor transformation from the public improvements and private investments to change the market perceptions. And then the introduction of the BRT will accelerate the redevelopment by changing the public realm. It will also help focus activity at those stationary nodes and improve accessibility and increase your demand. You've got some supportive zoning in place and some great policies that the planning folks have already done, which I think are wonderful to set the stage. And then finally, the other things that we really see from these other 
um, jurisdictions is successful implementation really depends on forceful leadership by organizations that have a clear mandate, dedicated staff and resources, all of which I believe the county is prepared to support Richmond Highway in moving forward. So here's the example that I love to throw out. Um, I know the image is not wonderful, but bear with me. This is Second Street in Rochester, Minnesota. And from the time period of 2009, the community got together and they wanted to look at just a three mile stretch of this. And they said, we really need to get in here and we need to change the corridor. And so the efforts made on the Second Street corridor to make it more pedestrian friendly and reduce the traffic patterns. What you can see from the picture on the left to the picture on the right is that the development came right back up to the street exactly like we were talking about at Beacon Groveton and pulled that up, put that parking in the back, made it more pedestrian friendly and shifted. The sidewalks were widened, the crosswalks were improved, the curb cuts were reduced. It had been just known as suburbia and folks were driving fast and furious down the road. They had a commercial vacancy rate drop from 5.5% to 2.5% the vehicle speeds dropped <clears throat> to 30 miles an hour. There was a $7 million investment. And overall, the property values increased by 30% because that was, it was enough with the public investment to shift that private side and make that redevelopment um, happen. When we think about the infrastructure and the public realm improvements, I just want to talk about Aurora Avenue in Shoreline, Washington. This is another BRT corridor, and it reminds me a lot of Richmond Highway. What's important here is that the median improvements for the BRT included um, upgrades to the sidewalk and utility undergrounding. They began this planning in 1998 and it took them 18 years to complete this, but they used 21 different sources of funding. The roadway itself was improved with these medians and turn lanes, but they also added 1,700 new households and they attracted a ton of new businesses. So what's important here is that the BRT rapid ride is one of six BRT lines that are run by King County, but the success that they saw along this corridor really reflects the investment that they made in the infrastructure and the public realm. And we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that. So across all of the, even the two that I just mentioned, but as well, the other examples, technical assistance to really key legacy businesses was huge. So this is not one specific uh, jurisdiction, but all of the jurisdictions that we reviewed. They expanded existing programs for legacy businesses. They preserved small portions and more affordable commercial centers. And that doesn't mean you have to preserve the entire center for redevelopment, but just a small portion so that you can keep those businesses there. They built technical capacity with virtual lessons, um, learned with one-on-one -on -one counseling. You guys already have a wealth of this happening in Fairfax County. Really where I see it is the need for the county to further market what you currently have and make sure that it's in um, multiple of languages and that that information is just repeatedly given out to the community to build their um, efforts and then helping them to market and organize um, and with moving forward with that uh, will be important, but it'll also be something that will be led by some of the entities that are already along the corridor. I believe that you've got two or three really great uh, partners who will be able to help out and move forward. So when we think about community branding, I have three examples here. And I think a good example, the top left is the Battle Road Scenic Byway. This runs parallel to Route 2, it's up in Massachusetts. And you may say, well, a scenic byway is very different than a Route 1 corridor, and that is true. But what we saw here was a partnership where they had an umbrella brand, which was the Road to Revolution. But each of the individual, Arlington, Lexington, Lincoln, and Concord kept their identities. And this is really important for Richmond Highway. Route one is known as Richmond Highway here. You have an umbrella brand. We wanna keep the distinctions at each of your CBCs that was outlined in that Embark's plan initially to keep them retaining their unique identity. If you lose that, you will lose part of the success and what the market is already building on. Down uh, below that, I have the Max BRT in Kansas City. Now here, it's not a bus. This is really important. People say, I ride the max. I don't ride a bus. It's changed the perception of what that BRT is, but they named the stations here for the communities. 
So they would have had one that would have been called High Blue Valley Gum Springs. They named him for the communities and they understood that entity and they never lost it. They also did a competition for the artwork. You can see here on the screen. I like this one because it's nighttime, it's lit up, there's activity going, you know, it's not nine to five, it's into the evening. And that's what our corridor already is. And then finally on the right hand side of this slide, the new avenue marketing efforts by Montgomery County really helped to rebrand this this section. Like Route 1 in Fairfax County has distinguished Richmond Highway. They said, you know, you could be New Hampshire Avenue anywhere, but this is the new avenue. It's a distinct section of it so that it doesn't get confused with other sections of that same corridor. Okay, I think my, oh, there we go. So for community programming and space activation is the hallmark of successful urban commercial districts. As we shift, we need to think about shoppers and other community members that'll seek out opportunities for interaction in their neighborhoods. The best business districts and neighborhood centers offer programs and activities to draw customers. So here on the left-hand side, we have this terrific young girl running outside and she's not wearing a mask because this was pre-COVID, but she is in a Brazilian community that was desperate to reduce traffic fatalities. They were shifted to temporary urbanism, not on purpose. They had a few extra dollars left in their budget. They had improved their pedestrian environment. So they went to a back parking lot behind the shopping centers and painted the ground. So they basically just got a couple of cans of paint, a few hundred dollars, and then they allowed, this was really important, flexible retailers, bring your own furniture. So already right now along Richmond Highway Court, you have people who put up their tents. So just let them put up their tents. You, you pull in the community there. And they saw this increase. They lost some of the vacancies in their traditional retail space due to this informal space. And they had no idea that this success uh, was gonna be what it was. In San Francisco, which is the next image in the middle here, this is a great one. They have a development site. The development site is ready to go. They pursued housing and they wanted to do an affordable housing mixed use project and they missed the first round. So they had to wait a whole nother year for competition so that they could open up and get those funding again, right? It takes a village, it takes a lot of funding sources. So they said, while we're waiting, it's gonna be at least another year, let's put some shipping containers on this parking lot and let some entrepreneurs come in and start some businesses. So these are not entrepreneurs who have enough inventory to open or have a full space, but they were willing to come into temporary space and use it. Then they also said, let's put up a movie screen. I'm, I think you've already done this along Richmond Highway Corridor, but Proxy, as it became known, became an innovative and creative programming to changing food, art, entertainment, and retail uses in these shipping containers. And it draws crowds from blocks upon blocks and it's just two blocks in San Francisco. And then finally, um, on the right side here, in 2011, Christchurch, New Zealand, had a series of earthquakes and they lost a ton of their, basically their urbanized and suburban business core outside of downtown. And so to get in there, they really had an effort championed by the central government to rebuild the infrastructure. But what they did was they established a series of nonprofit entities that enlivened vacant space and parcels. And the key here is that they held the insurance and then the folks who wanted to come in and put on a concert or the food trucks that wanted to come in, they already had that insurance covered by uh, live for vacant space. And that really helped enable more people. They also coordinated all the programming efforts. So if your church choir wanted to come practice outside, you could do it on Tuesday at 7 p.m., but they wouldn't have that, you know, at the same time as the other concert. And they enlivened these vacant spaces that were waiting for redevelopment in, in the midst of rubble. And so it's a great example of how to rebuild and demolish it, but it shows you the temporary uses can really be activated. These kids right here are playing on a large, huge, giant joystick, but the screen that they're playing the game on is across a street, a cross street. So you can imagine along Richmond Highway, we have some cross streets, not going across Route 1, but going across those side streets will enliven the space, but it also stops people, gets them to interact and kind of shifts the environment. So finally, um, on investor relations, at the beginning of our assessment in that stage one existing conditions, we looked at the assessment and we highlighted opportunities based on land utilization analysis and where there was potential for redevelopment. And I'm going to turn it over to Victor now, who can speak a little more directly about the, how the EDA works with these types of opportunities and lays them out. Thank you, Abigail. Appreciate that. 
<clears throat> First of all, I want to thank uh, Chairman Faust for inviting me to be here today and also for um, really supporting all the economic initiatives that have gone on in the county. I want to thank Supervisor Stork and Supervisor Lusk uh, for their and their staff for their guidance. They gave us a lot of guidance through this process, um, really kept us focused on um, meeting the community needs and addressing community needs. Um, and Chairman McKay, uh, what you said earlier about Build Back Better, um, the billion dollar investment that you're making in this area, um, it, it's, it's gonna go and, and it's gonna pay off in, in di great dividends in the long run. Um, you've already started um, with the RISE program. Um, you've invested over $52 million in minority women um, and better known businesses, which is just profound um, and is actually set an example for the whole country. Um, and uh, really, I have to say that County Executive Hill has done an excellent job of his leadership, um, working with Rebecca Moldry and others with the Department of Economic Initiatives. You need this kind of alignment in order to attract investment. Um, and Brian Hill and I have met um, with, with Freddie Mac, Capital One, and a number of the Fortune 500 companies um, to really start having these conversations. And in addition to that, we've met with five other investors um, that invest in multifamily and mixed use property from around the country to talk to them about opportunities in this area. Uh, let me begin by saying that, um, you know, Stephen Tard Tarditi's uh, mission in this, in this regard was to help us begin to really align um, our, our thoughts in, in how the government, how the private sector and the community can align in order to best meet the needs um, of revitalization. Um, I've been, I've spent about half my career in the private sector and half my career in the public sector, and I've been involved in revitalization strategies from South Central Los Angeles to Ward 8 in Washington, D.C. Um, I've been in some extraordinarily difficult environments and achieved revitalization. Um, but what you find in all of these environments are the same three characteristics. Number one, you have to be equipped with information. That's what this was all about. That's what this work was all about. And from that information, you create a strategy. That's the next stage of this, creating this strategy. And simultaneously, as you create the strategy, you engage with investors. And that's one of the things that we're going to start doing, engaging in investors. And not just the, not the, just the six or seven or eight that we've met with so far, but we are going to launch a marketing program really pointed and targeted at various sites throughout the, um, throughout the corridor. The Economic Development Incentive Program, um, which you've put in place, is one um, that all the investors that we've spoken to um, it really attracted their attention and they are looking at the opportunities along the corridor. I think the thing to, to remember though is that, is that it's, it's also the pro-business um, environment that, you're, that you've created and that you continue to create uh, in the county. This is another thing that the investors have been very uh, excited about. Um, and then the market projections, of course, the information on what sites can yield um, in terms of residential development, commercial development is extremely important. Now, the empty vacant retail is probably going to be the biggest challenge, um, and that's going to take investment. The $15 million uh, proposed investment um, in, in retail along the corridor and commercial along the corridor will make a huge difference. Um, and that is really um, going to be a very important part of going forward. How do you selectively use uh, those investments to really uh, turn the corner um, on, on various areas? The federal programs um, that have been that have come along, uh, the PPP program, for example, PPP one, and now PPP two, um, we're continuing to work uh, with businesses uh, to access those programs. As a matter of fact, we had an event last week with a couple of hundred people, uh, a couple of hundred businesses, uh, looking at how they could use that, that program. Some of them are from from this area, but we really do feel um, that we have to really sit down um, and and. And, and grind into the specific details on what we are going to continue to do in physical improvements, in marketing, um, and investment. Um, you know, Fairfax County Economic Development is already working with several groups along the corridor, as I mentioned, and what we see is an opportunity uh, to expand those groups and to draw them in. And with that, um, I'd like to turn it back over to Supervisor uh, Faust. Thank you, Victor. Appreciate it. Uh, as usual, uh, you, you, you're very to the point, very, very helpful information, uh, and really appreciated that presentation uh, by PES and all your efforts, Abigail. It's pretty obvious that you're passionate about what you do, and you uh, really have, uh, I think, presented us with an amazing plan. So uh, we have an opportunity to take uh, a few questions. Uh, 
and then we have another very important presentation that we're going to uh, have. Uh, so I think Rebecca is watching for hands to go up. If anybody wanted to ask a question or comment on the presentation we just had. Are there any hands up, Rebecca? There's no hands up. There is a question in the um, in the chat. Oh, I just saw one hand, but I'll, I'll throw this out. Catherine Ward asked in the chat, um, how do we keep the developers from building the same type of buildings they build everywhere, the same designs with the same look? So any, any thoughts um, from the PES team on that? I think that's partly why I spent some time talking about branding and the like. I think if a developer comes in and you already have established your brand and they come into that CBC and you can say, look, this is where we've already established this brand. This is what it is. What you can often find is just in that conversation with them and just showing them what you've already established, they will sort of adopt that and identify that. I don't think it's necessary to have really strict requirements. We like to give a little bit of flexibility so they can still get that return on investment. I also think that public art and art in public spaces, places where you might put that in, will help expand that identity. And you can talk about doing that on a private investor's site, on a, on a privately held site. It doesn't have to be just on public property. We always think Think of that as, oh, we'll put the public art on public property, but you can make arrangements to do that as well, which help to shift that again. And that's been the success that we've seen in some of our other places. We didn't talk about it, but we worked on a project in Florida, a bus rapid transit, and there they didn't have a choice but to work with the private held properties to really help connect and build their brand. And so it was beyond the station areas. I hope that's responsive. I also saw in the chat, someone asked about temporary business space. And again, that was one of the key sections in the report where we talked about preserving um, space, affordable space for legacy businesses, but also to allow those temporary folks to come in. And your planning staff just prepared a series of guidelines, and I think uh, Joanne, Phoebe, and some others are on the call that could respond to that, that really allow for that flexibility in a way that doesn't overly burden it so that it's too big of a lift for temporary uh, users and pop-up retailers and the like. Thank you, Abby. And Stephen Keat has a question. Uh, go ahead, Stephen. Yes, thank you. Um, when you were talking about the um, impact on the Richmond corridor and in terms of you know, demand for office space, I started to think in terms of, well, what about the pandemic? And you then addressed that question, so you were ahead of me. But um, I'm wondering to what extent would we expect the post-pandemic world to be different in the Richmond corridor as compared to other parts of the county? So that's a great question. I think it builds on something we talked about in our report. I think that post pandemic, we do still believe there'll be a return to office space. But what the strength along the Richmond Highway corridor has been is that your office space has been geared toward that resident base. And so you will continue to sort of stay um, stable in that sense, in that regard. And you won't have the shifts of um, emptying out of space as people decide to become more efficient and reductions. And so you're ahead of the game. If we had known there was a pandemic, we wouldn't have told you uh, to do this. So we couldn't have predicted this ourselves, but I think that that is been sort of the qualifier and the shift in that. And I don't know, Anita, if you wanna say anything more, I just wanna give her a chance to talk to that as well, Anita. Or maybe she doesn't have anything else to add. I'm not sure. <laughs> I got to unmute. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so there, uh, you may see some um, shifting to uh, satellite offices. Uh, one of the things that people have talked about is perhaps you still have your mega main office, but you have outposts that are closer to people's homes now that they've gotten used to the idea of much less commuting. Um, and that could be an opportunity for the corridor, but I think it is primarily the, the advantage you have that so many of your office tenants are cu customer oriented and not um, providing services that are easy to provide from home, so. All right, thank you. You know, I, uh, I think uh, we have such a great presentation coming up. I don't want to uh, shortchange it. Uh, if you have thoughts, questions, 
suggestions, please use the chat. Uh, we'll have, uh, we'll ask uh, Rebecca and her team to respond to any questions that you uh, uh, put forward on the chat and uh, share those answers with everyone on the commission. But uh, it, in the interim, uh, we really need to uh, move on and uh, to our next presentation, which uh, is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, COVID pandemic has had disproportionate impacts on racial and ethnic minorities in the county, including bad health outcomes, uh, job and business losses, and other adverse uh, economic impacts. And our next presenter, Dr. Leon Caldwell, is the founder of Ujima Developers LLC. Dr. Caldwell will make a presentation on a model for comprehensive, equitable development that promotes the economic mobility, health, and wellness of existing residents and communities. Just uh, by way of introduction, a fascinating resume, Dr. Caldwell is an award-winning community-based researcher, social entrepreneur, and transformational leader. Ujima Developers was founded on the premise that communities can be transformed with intentional investments to improve life outcomes of residents. Dr. Caldwell has been involved in real estate as a developer, builder, investor, and property manager since 1999. So after a successful career as an associate professor, award-winning community-based researcher, national thought leader on black men and boys health, social entrepreneur, and senior leader in the philanthropic sector and author of over 50 national and international publications, he established Ujima Developers LLC as a public health intervention for blighted neighborhoods. Uh, I will now ask uh, Dr. Caldwell to please make his presentation. Good morning, everyone. How are you? This is a uh a fascinating um, set of uh, conversations and circumstances we're in. I'm gonna try to get my screen to fully share here in this version of it. Um, there we go. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I wanna thank um, uh, the Rebecca and Teresa and, and Carla Bruce for um, the invitation. This is incredible work that the county is doing. I'm extremely impressed. Um, with the leadership and the, just the level of conversations that previous uh, discussion and, and presentation flows really well into what um, you know my or the company is about, but also uh, what I think the conversation could pivot to is that if and I'm using um, uh, Chairman McKay's words, but if there's a idea of the <laughs> concept of building back uh, better and equitable. Um, one of the things that you know, I think is, is incredibly important to have uh, in the discussion is how do we do that in an in equitable way in cultivating talent to match or build the, uh, the potential of the, of the county to take this corridor and other parts as well and, and build a strong, viable economy an ecosystem that supports an economy. So I wanted to just, just say I'm pleased to be here. And I know in the interest of time, I'm gonna, my, the slides are posted and I'm just gonna go through and hit some of the kind of the highlights. Um, so I wanna talk about this idea of what is holistic, equitable real estate development. And some of your questions in the chat from the previous discussion really addresses this. Um, and it's the strategic investments, which, which the previous presentation talked about in acquisition and programming to promote this economic mobility, health and well-being for residents. And this is in particular looking at, um, and I think uh, 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 Chairman Faust uh, mentioned that the, the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 uh, kind of uh, recovery, as well as the implications of, of COVID on communities, particularly communities of color um, has had. Um, and those disproportionalities are not based on just COVID. They existed, they were historic disadvantages. So understanding kind of what that actually um, means and meant for communities prior to COVID is important in understanding what the potential is to really reimagine, I think is the word I heard from, from uh, um, uh, Supervisor Lusk even, uh, reimagining what some of the spaces you all have 
uh, available and accessible in, in some of the corridors or some, some of the spaces along the corridor, the potential of using that space to really reimagine a more equitable economic situation. Um, in our uh, company, we really focus on two, two things. I mean, I'm a for-profit company, so of course I'm interested in the ROI, and, you know, the returns, but I'm also interested in what I, what I term as the community return investment. It's a piece I wrote um, not too long ago in the planphilly.com uh, magazine. There's this idea of that there is a set of returns that we rarely talk about that implications for communities. Um, and, and we can't define those as a developer. I really can't define those. Like those are uh, part of my engagement strategy with communities to really think through and talk about, well, what is it that's gonna promote your optimal uh, health? What is it gonna promote a place where you thrive? And as an investor, I see, uh, and, and a developer, I see my relationship is, is supporting the, this kind of these outcomes with communities as well. Um, our work is, you know, uh, in the order to do talent cultivation and use real estate in that way, you know, we're data driven and community informed and, and solution focused. I mean, these are kind of the three things in terms of brand we want to actually make sure people have access to good data, like the data you just presented um, by your, your previous uh, uh, presenters. Um, we actually community informed and solution focused. We use this idea of braided alignment, which is an approach I have that talks about inclusion, um, from inclusion as a kind of conceptual alignment, there's an, a, a policy alignment, there's a, a funding alignment, and then finally an implementation alignment. And these kind of strands in the brand make for sustainable approaches. The triangulation of both the data and lived experiences is really important, um, particularly, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a cultural nuance that comes with doing work. Um, in communities, particularly communities who've been historically marginalized. Um, and I think this is part of, uh, you know, the one Fairfax agenda as well, is this idea that there's key informants in communities that should be tapped when you're thinking about um, doing development that is holistic and equitable. Um, oftentimes we will have the uh, kind of the big companies or the big developers come in and talk about what is they want to have happen to a community and even your, one of your previous uh, questions in the um, in the chat box alluded to this. You know, there is a way, and is a I think a thoughtful way of engaging communities and key informants in communities that have knowledge about uh, the historical uh, variations, but also uh, what the architecture architecture should look like, what the buildings should look like, what they should feel like. Because um, you want to if you want to place make and have communities um, in, in 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 be engaged in this process, uh, there's ways in which. Uh, the talent that's in communities can engage the redevelopment and be part of the redevelopment conversation of which the um, the end is a sustainable product. Um, and that's something that, uh, as you all know, around the country, there's a considerable concern about the reality that increased costs for construction will actually increase the cost of living. Um, so that's something that, you know, for our, what Ujima focuses on is having this idea of that economic mobility uh, is, a, is a much better kind of branding than saying even poverty reduction or um, changing from low income or uh, just addressing affordable housing and things of that nature. This really, for us, the STEAMY workspace um, that we've created is a, is a makerspace model that really is a teach them how to fish model. And that's a total notion of self-determination is built within this, uh, our, our company fabric, but the steamy workspace is, is really an example of, of this makerspace model or makerspace that actually is really strategically aligned to cultivate talent in tech oriented fields. So this is, you know, uh, the, I, I think about, I, I wrote a paper not too long ago for the Department of Navy called Operation Steampunk. And what's really clear is that it is a really a national security issue that we rarely talk about. The, the level of, or the really the decline in skilled technical workers in our country that can do, uh, we think about STEM as being just science engineers, but there's a whole set of, which is a larger population um, of potential uh, wage earners that are skilled technical workers that we rarely tap into. And we, we talk about them in terms of uh, vocations and trades, but it's something that even is in between that. So 
STEMI, which is uh, STEM, we added the A for art to get STEAM, the I is for innovation, and the E is for entrepreneurship. Um, the M is actually squared for both math and manufacturing. And I'll talk a little bit about this uh, um, as I go along. One of the pieces that, um, you know, in, in terms of operationalizing STEAMI is the target is uh, residents who, you know, have been, for the most part, um, not included in uh, tech-oriented opportunities. Um, and this is really important because we think about tech-oriented opportunities uh, I think our previous iteration of these conversations were focused on, you know, college obtained uh, uh, people who are college trajectory. Um, and we know that as technology and even seeing now with COVID-19, there's, there's a lot of opportunity in that space of which um, a college degree is not necessary, but post-secondary training of some sort is, is uh, possible. The, the county has a rich set of data um, to show you where those gaps are. Um, and, and it is about four or five that I think highlight when the skilled technical uh, worker conversation that, you know, you, you could look at actually. <clears throat> We've um, termed this as a kind of an urban neighborhood centered economic mobility strategy, strategy. Um, partly because uh, in sprawling places, um, transportation is usually a big issue, right? Um, and this is why you're embarking on uh, the rich and corridor transportation plan in the first place is that how do you get people uh, uh, to move and, and be mobile and to some extent you know a county's um transportation policies are really or any jurisdiction's transportation policy is really about freedom and liberation i mean i, I grew up in, in west philly and the ability to you know take a trolley or train uh, publicly anywhere was was a sense of, of of you can get anywhere you wanted in the city and it allowed me different opportunities to work play um, and even learn. So my school was like an hour bus ride from where um, I actually live. So there's this notion that having a place-based strategy as you start to redevelop is, is critical. Uh, and, and thinking about how to mitigate um, the transportation, not only cost, but time, uh, particularly for people with lower resources, economic resources. Um, the project I'm um, currently uh, doing now is in West Philadelphia. Um, those who are familiar with West Philadelphia. It's uh, right near the Philadelphia Zoo, which is the oldest zoo in the country, I might add. Um, and that, um, this building is in a, uh, this, this neighborhood's been economically distressed for some time. Um, there is a lot of assets, as I'll show you in the next slide. Um, here is, you know, this is not Richmond Corridor by any stretch, but what I wanted to demonstrate is how do you take a, a landmass um, look strategically and, and, and think about well, what goes in it that supports the, the essentially the, the thriving of people in a neighborhood. Um, when I say this, I'm saying it in the sense that the um, idea is uh, these investments that I've made are a housing investment around affordable age-friendly housing. Um, and I say uh, affordable age-friendly, it's also accessible as well. Um, honeysuckle provisions, which is a food justice um, project that we're working on, which will put a, a mixed-use building with 18 units of uh, apartments, um, a floor that does telemedicine, telehealth to deal with the digital divide that we're, we're now seeing will have implications of thinking about, you know, post-COVID, um, telehealth and telemedicine will not go anywhere. Um, and a, uh, a honeysuckle provisions, which is essentially a food retail place uh, which will hire uh, several people from the community and also provide ghost kitchens um, and commissary kitchen opportunities for entrepreneurs in the food industry. Um, it will also host a, a vertical farm. Um, so we've, we've kind of dubbed this whole uh, place and, uh, as a, a make, uh, live and grow community um, in terms of branding. Um, the steamy workspace, as you'll see off to uh, the bottom right, uh, is where you know the, the maker space will be uh, converted or that space will be converted into a maker space and, a, and an agri-tech center. And that agri urban agri-tech center is really important because it's really teaching folks um, how to do vertical farming um, and the business of, um, of, of micro farming in, in urban spaces. So the uh, piece that the previous um, presentation uh, alluded to was the walkability and accessibility. Like when you start thinking about large spaces and, and carving out 
just one piece of it. Um, you know, as you can see in this massive 10 minute walk from where you may work uh, at Steamy Workspace. And by the way, Steamy Workspace is both a programmatic uh, asset in terms of ha helping people um, kind of go through different uh, like welding, uh, 3D printing, which is the basis for adaptive manufacturing, um, an IT space for cybersecurity training. Um, we'll have a textile space uh, and, and many other uh, opportunities for um, kind of entry level uh, career and access to skilled technical workers, skilled technical work uh, careers um, with um, CNC routers, things of that nature. These classic makerspace, but it's also um, a place for small business to incubate, um, which is a, a really important piece of this. It's, it's both the training piece, but also the introduction um, to, uh, uh, to, to STEM, to the future of work, really. Um, and one of the things that's clear in this neighborhood and many other neighborhoods like it is um, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And in many cases, um, folks from are not getting access to things in schools, um, whatever, you know, the bottom line of why there's either push out or drop out or disengagement, um, there's still this talent in many cities and many places that can be activated for the, uh, this recovery that we're all need to be experiencing and a more equitable recovery, as was said earlier. So a 10 minute walk from your place of training and work to potentially home at the age friendly village. And on the way, you can stop and grab something to eat. Um, and a question I think in just the interest of time, and I know I'm speeding through this, I know there's hopefully there's some questions and, and some discussion to be had, but in the interest of uh, time, you know, the question is really around, and it seems to be a political will of this investment uh, that's going to really push for a more equitable um, opportunity for real estate development or the use of real estate development to cultivate talent. And, you know, the, the question, when I usually typically ask questions is, you know, in terms of thinking about cultivating talent, because um, much of the plans that were talked about in previous in the previous discussion, all these talks about real estate, talks about retail, talks about growth. Um, the equitable piece of this is, is, is critical. Um, and the acknowledgement that the talent that currently exists is disproportionate, like the cultivation of talent is disproportionate. So how then does one create um, an equitable framework for cultivating talent for the future of work? Um, and we know that if you look at the job loss across the country and definitely in, in the county, those were lower skilled jobs, right? And lower income jobs, right? So if you, if you consider that and think about, well, what post pandemic uh, will be needed as a previous question was posed. You know, this idea that there's gaps, existing jobs that could be filled in your county, who is actually cultivating the talent to fill those gaps? Because that's the, that, and how does real estate play in that? Like, how do you actually build and brand a community that is really trying to cultivate talent? And as we call it, we, in, in this uh, iteration of uh, the West Philadelphia project, we are really building a make, live, and grow community. So with that, um, I'll end. Sorry, I felt a little rushed, but I just wanted to respect people's uh, time as we kind of move along. So I'm going to turn it back to uh, Mr. Faust. Here. I think you're on mute. You're muted, John. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Caldwell. That was a uh, an excellent presentation, and, and uh, it, what you're doing is, is so admirable. And uh, we're really uh, glad that we we've made this connection, and hopefully we'll have opportunities uh, to work together in the future. Uh, I am going to open it up again to questions. I I do believe that uh, in order to make sure we got the last presentation or this recent presentation in. I cut off my good friend, Phil Nozelski Eichner and Todd House, both of whom I think had their hands up. So if either of you uh, want to uh, make a comment or ask a question, and then uh, I will turn it over to Rebecca to keep an eye on the 
the hands that are being raised. Nope. Okay. Rebecca, anybody have their hand up? Um, also, uh, Philip had put his question in the chat. So we're going to, just as a reminder, we're, we're gathering all of those and we'll make sure that we respond back to folks and working with the, the consultants and the presenters. So Supervisor Palchuk um, has her hand up. Please go ahead. Sure. Thank you so much, Rebecca, uh, Chairman Faust, and, and Dr. Caldwell. Um, just want to keep it brief. Really appreciate this presentation. Um, Personally, it's bringing me back to my microfinance work uh, and what things like Grameen Foundation and others have been able to do abroad. Um, so I hope we can bring this to other parts of the county. Um, and my question for you is um, one of the big um, concerns I've heard and from local business owners, um, minority business owners is the access to capital. So I don't know if you've considered that in some of these projects and how to um, better bring that locally as well for small businesses yeah that's an excellent point i mean i myself as a relatively small shop um but against that as a developer with big ideas um and i think the uh the challenge with the access I mean, it's just structural i mean we can talk about structural racism all day which address which is uh undergirding some of this but this is where i think the public um partnerships come into play like acknowledging that um and also philanthropy uh, one of the projects that I'm working on, the STEAM workspace, as a matter of fact, it was um, our equity partner in for the first two years was actually uh, Fells Foundation of Philadelphia um, because the, the capital stack looked, you know, subsidy and everything else we needed. Since then, um, that investment of about maybe $200,000, since then I've been able to capture over a million dollars in uh, additional funding and subsidy through the state of Pennsylvania. We'll do an EDA grant and um, some other uh, um, USDA grant, things of that nature, which will, and the DOD grant, uh, Office of Naval Research, we're applying for some funding for that as well. So it is really the, the blended capital that's necessary. And um, for uh, where the marketplace um, fails uh, minority businesses or businesses owned by historically disadvantaged uh, folks, that the, the public sector can actually play an important critical role whether that's with credit enhancements, seed funding, things of that nature that's necessary. Um, and then it also has to carry a big stick into some of these large corporations as well, um, to, in particular banks and financial institutions and, and asking the question of, you know, well, why is this happening, right? Um, because it's not new, it's been out there and it's the part of structural issues that we, we, we need to challenge. And the, you know, the entity with the biggest uh, checkbook oftentimes is the uh, is the is the pri is the public sector the public systems? Really appreciate it. I would love to borrow a little more of your time at another time, but thank you again. This is absolutely what we need to um, be looking at and learning from in the county. Thank you. Thank you. And Angie also has a question. Hi. Um, thank you so much for all the information. Really superb today. Um, one of my questions is with the Class C buildings in the Route One corridor. Um, obviously there's many and many landlords, but are we finding that the landlords are seeking to stay and hold out for a redevelopment deal? Or are they seeking to stay and be relevant and willing to convert for new uses? I would think that's probably a, the previous um, presenters would probably answer that question. Okay. Um, Abby or uh, Anita, are you on to, and have yeah, I'm still on. And I would say that um, we saw both. So we saw a few and, and not everybody's willing to tell you what they're going to do, obviously. So from the few that we um, where I talked to brokers or I spoke to somebody, they were like, there's a few owners who are trying to stay put. I think you have, it's really important to understand that when you're earning money and you have a building and you have low, your, your mortgage is paid off and you have a classy building, what's the incentive to reinvest if you think redevelopment's coming and financially? So that's where the assemblage and these tools that the county's putting into play will help to kind of shift that trajectory. But we saw a little bit of both is, is the best answer to that question. But thanks for asking. I saw that in the chat. And I see Esther has her hand up, Esther. 
Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I just wanted to add to Leon's answer. Um, obviously, access to capital is, is the most important thing for small businesses and startups. So um, we at Refraction, along with partners like George Mason and others, and Leon, I'd love to talk to you more about this, are planning a series of uh, pitch events, pitch events and um, other events to bring capital from outside of our region. Um, as we, I think, all know, Northern Virginia lags other peer regions when it comes to amount of venture capital and funding for small, uh, startups and small businesses. And so as we do that, we'd love to partner with partners to do that. Um, and then I would also just add that you know, I was advisor to the Biden campaign, and we made a recommendation that um, then candidate Biden announced in the Build Back Better plan that um, they support investing in a national network of innovation hubs. Um, it, like refraction, like what Leon is proposing. And so I do think there will be federal funding as well um, uh, that will help uh, small businesses. So look forward to working with you, Leon. And if I may, um, uh, Supervisor Faust, I just put it in the chat. I just wanted to let everyone know Chairman McKay and Supervisor Faust will be participating in the Smart City Challenge finale on Thursday, of which Fairfax County is a sponsor and a partner. And so I encourage all of you to register and, and join us. There'll be 11 amazing companies, uh, teams pitching, um, and uh, we have a number of prizes. So great to see you all. We can... Uh... Perhaps, Rebecca, we could put out uh, uh, some information to the uh, membership so that they know how to uh, uh, go online to participate in that virtual or observe that virtual uh, activity. It's also in the chat. That it's link. in the chat. Okay. Well, yep. Oops, sorry. Okay. We're taken care of. Okay. Um, we're getting to the point where we need to wrap up. Was there anything else, uh, either our um, staff, our presenters or our membership wanted to uh, bring to our attention before we um, uh, conclude the meeting. So has there been any other updates in regards to um, the low quantity of food grocery stores along this corridor and any opportunities for vertical farming? Is that a Abigail question? I think so. Sorry, I keep jumping off. Not sure that it's still me. Um, there is the grocery store demand did not pop up that it was sufficient enough um, to warrant new construction of a new grocery store. So replacement and upgrades to the existing um, operations of grocery stores. Vertical farming, yes, I'm always a fan of vertical farming. Um, have long since been a proponent of that and that supplements the supply, doesn't um, detract from it. So I think that that is a potential. Hey, I, I had something about the food access piece, particularly for um, immigrant communities. Um, the preference for smaller markets is uh, where people actually have access to culturally relevant food is um, maybe one of the reasons why it doesn't pop up high because people do have what they like to eat um, culturally. But I would say that the, these smaller markets and not the big chains might be the future way to go. Um, yeah, I think the best, the best way grocery store, which is one, that's an example of exactly of what Dr. Caldwell is talking about that already occurs in Richmond Highway. Um, so you have sort of these informal smaller bodegas and other operations that are filling that gap. So, and we wouldn't want to introduce more to compete with them because we want to keep them. Um, so they would be some of the preservation pieces. And I would say how, how one, uh, you know, friendly amendment to that is in terms of a public health perspective, um, there's oftentimes the quality of those foods, the, the necessary, the kind of dietary place and like Philly and, and New York and some of these other cities, um, those uh, markets typically have higher sodium uh, foods. Um, it's, it's all kinds of stuff that, that while it's accessible, it may not be the healthiest thing. So some um, emergence in this ecosystem around with public health with some of this work is I think critical. Okay. Well, uh, I, uh, again, I, I thank our presenters so much for a really uh, outstanding uh, uh, morning and uh, thought provoking and hopefully uh, uh, helping us uh, along the path that we need to uh, pursue to bring our economy back and to, uh, in particular, focus on those uh, members of our community who were disproportionately uh, impacted by uh, this terrible pandemic. Uh, 
So I want to thank everyone who participated. And I want to remind you that our next meeting is June 1st. Uh, the uh, Board's Economic Initiatives Committee will be meeting on March 16th. Uh, and uh, I would encourage you to uh, log in to observe that meeting. It's going to be a very interesting discussion of the fund of the, uh, the recommendations of our consultants for uh, re recovering our economy and recommendations from our staff on how we might, uh, specific programs and funding uh, that we would uh, consider implementing. So with that, thank you all very, very much and uh, have a great day.